think, hurry, Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. We have with us tonight um, attorney Arthur Bergeron from Merrick and O'Connell, who's going to talk about Alzheimer's. And he also brought a panel of experts, which I'll have him introduce to you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank I you. really appreciate it. And thank you very much for inviting us to come. Um, my name, hi, my name is Arthur Bergeron. You haven't met me. Uh, I work at a firm called Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us. That's a lot. Um, one of the nice things about that is that people who are there get to kind of specialize, and this is all I do. I do elder law. Um, and one of the things, and people say, well, now what is that exactly? What is elder law exactly? And so elder law really has to do with, you know, kind of trying to figure out all of the issues that you're trying to deal with as you're retired. When one of your goals is to, to not run out of money before you die, and the other is to make sure that things get passed along. But there are a set of issues that are kind of really, really important, and that I find just about all of my clients being concerned about. As I tell people, about 90% of my clients are either worried about Alzheimer's, or they have Alzheimer's, or their relative has Alzheimer's, and that's why they're talking about a lot of this stuff, because for folks who have assets, say, less than $2 million, this is their biggest issue. Their biggest issue is trying to figure this out. And for most people, and I'm going to talk to you about my couple here um, a little bit. Uh, for most people, uh, I find they're a lot like my couple here, Frank and Mary. So first I'm going to introduce my folks. Monica, there are a set of players, another piece of elder law. This is my first time in Hollison, so I'm going to sound a little confused here. So uh, a, another piece of elder law is having you folks understand kind of who the main players are and the players that you can kind of contact or people that you can just kind of put, it, put a, a name to a program so you can understand what the programs are. Monica Alley is here from um, Bay Path Elder Services. Bay Path Elder, raise your hand if you've heard of Bay Path Elder Services. Oh, you must have already been here. That is great. So you know then, Bay Path Elder Services is the Aging Services Access Point or ASAP, which is the entity that's working for you. Basically, it's your tax dollars at work. Federal and state dollars come through them to get given to you. They are kind of the gatekeeper regarding most programs for elders in this 14 town area. So I've asked Monica to come over to specifically talk about the Bay Path programs that affect you and your loved one if someone has moderate to, to kind of moderate stages of dementia. So she's just a really kind of an, an important player and she's gonna be talking a little bit. I've, I've asked Shelby Marshall to come. Shelby is part of the Alzheimer's Partnership uh, which a set of us are involved in for this area because the Alzheimer's Association probably does more to deal with all of these issues than anybody does. Um, and we're going to be talking about the Alzheimer's Partnership and the Alzheimer's Association a little bit as we go along. She also, her day job is that she does, they do daycare. They're right in, in uh, Westboro and they have a large agency. So we want to talk about if you want to stay at home, the role of a daycare agency in kind of dealing with all of those issues. Gary Davis uh, runs um, all of the um, programs for folks with dementia at the Salmon facilities, at uh, the Beaumonts and Whitney Places. There's one in Westboro, one in Northboro, there's one down in Northbridge. They're like, there's one in Natick. There are a lot of places. He's been doing this kind of work for many, many years. And in several of their assisted, so that there are, there are dementia units in their nursing homes, but also they have several assisted livings in which there are memory care units. So for folks who really don't need nursing home care, but need a little help because you know, they're getting kind of confused, um, Gary deals with that. And I want him to talk about what kind of the role of an assisted living can be and kind of how, how, how you would go about looking at that as an option. Once again, if you or someone you love has, um, has um, mid, early, mid stages of dementia. So those are all the things we're going to talk about. First, I'm going to kind of introduce you to my friends Frank and Mary here. Um, my Fra Frank and Mary, I always talk about, um, they are my make-believe couple, and they've got you know, a reasonable amount of assets, and their goal is really to, to, to die and be buried in the backyard and, and eventually leave their property to their three children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I'm, I have Mary Jr. here because we're going to talk about Mary 
see, for the, for the people of our age, that's actually, Peter Paul, they get Peter, Paul, and Mary. You know, younger audiences don't get it. So Mary is, is the one who is going to be the one helping Ma and Dad at home if Ma and Dad are staying at home. So we're going to talk about them a little bit more. And the issue in this case is going to be, what about if Mary um, has got Alzheimer's or one of the other diseases that cause dementia? and things are progressing. As you, as you probably all know, dementia is not a disease, it's simply a set of symptoms, mostly involving cognitive impairment. One of the, the biggest causes of dementia, though, is Alzheimer's disease, so a lot of times people actually kind of talk about the two things at the same time. But that's the question. What if Mary has, has got serious dementia? Now, there are really three possibilities for Mary in this case. Now, I remember, um, I got involved in this because my mother died in a nursing home back in 1991, and I remember going through all of this with my dad and the denial and the anger and the whole thing. And at that time, that was pretty much the only option that people really had. If you had kind of mid-stage dementia, you didn't know kind of what to do, and a lot of times folks just kind of ended up at the nursing home. Uh, today, though, um, you have uh, this kind of evolution of these new places called assisted living communities in which increasingly there are dementia units. So there are folks, there are memory care units for folks who really don't need nursing home care, but, but do need some place where they can deal with some of these issues. And that's really what assisted living, uh, and that's a piece of assisted living. And, that, and then, as a result of a major kind of change in the way um, Medicaid, the federal program that pays for most nursing home care, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts have looked at this care, there's been this evolution of a set of programs aimed at keeping you at home, even though you have pretty serious stages of dementia, so that if you're otherwise eligible for nursing home care, you may very well be eligible to have Mass Health pay for a lot of care at home. So we're going to kind of talk about that briefly. So Frank and Mary, this is Frank and Mary. So they've got a house, and they've got an IRA, he's got an IRA worth $200,000, and they've got savings worth $300,000. So they get total assets of $800,000, counting the house, no mortgage. Uh, he's got an income, $1,500 from Social Security and $750 from a pension, total $2,250. She's got income, which is half of her, his, from Social Security, that's $750. So they're making about $27, um, uh, uh, or they're making about $3,000 a month, or $36,000 a year. They're going to be okay as long as there aren't serious problems. But if there are serious problems, if Mary needs a lot of care, then that money is going to get burned up pretty fast. Um, and so they need to kind of figure that out. So before we go on, just a quick little quick lesson. You'll hear this term, the activities of daily living. Well, isn't that everything? That's our activities of daily living. Well, there's actually a specific meaning for that, of, of, for those terms, uh, in this context. And it, they are the activities of daily living, dressing, eating, toileting, bathing, transferring. Transferring means getting up, getting across the room, and sitting down. If you need help in doing at least two of those, or if you um, need constant supervision because you have cognitive impairment, because your dementia has progressed, and there's some worry that you could really hurt yourself um, in, if, if someone isn't around you, then for mass health purposes, you can qualify for mass health, and, and mass health will then pay for your nursing home care as long as you are financially eligible. If you're Frank and Mary, oh, I'm sorry about that slide. Uh, if, you are, if you are Frank and Mary and Mary needs to go to a nursing home, and this is always everyone's last resort, you should just be aware that in this case, um, if Mary needs to go to a nursing home and they have the assets that we went through, um, um, she, Mary can qualify for Mass Health right away. Contrary to public and a lot of folks thinking, that be, and the reason for that is that while Mary's asset limit is $2,000, um, Frank can own the home as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000. I do some presentations in Nantucket, and that's actually a very cheap home in Nantucket, so they have a lot of problems. <laughs> but in most places, that's okay, right? Um, Frank can have cash or cash equivalent of assets of up to $119,220. And the line that was cut off there is that Frank can have infinite income. And therefore, in this situation, if Mary needed nursing home care and there weren't any alternatives to it, there weren't any alternatives to it, they could simply transfer all their assets to Frank to the extent that Frank has, and remember the house would be exempt now, to the extent that Frank has money of more than 119220 
he could go buy an annuity with it. An annuity, as far as Mass Health is concerned, is not an asset, it's just an income stream. And remember, he can have infinite income. And so as long as that annuity calls for monthly payments to him over his lifetime, um, or his life expectancy, the purchase of the annuity is a legitimate spend down, and Frank can immediately qualify, or excuse me, Mary can then immediately qualify for Mass Health because she has less than 2,000, Frank owns the house, which is okay, Frank has less than 119,000, and remember, he can have infinite income. So in that situation, which, no, which is their worst situation, at least they can know that um, Frank won't go bankrupt in addition to being so bummed out because Mary is in the nursing home and every, they're really depressed about this. Um, the only other thing that Frank would want to do in that case, though, it would, would be to probably change his will. If his will now says that everything is going to go to Mary, it should say that everything is going to go in trust for Mary's benefit. He can name one of the kids as the trustees. If he does that, then when he dies, all those assets are going to be safe. In terms of his, her care, the two things that you, want, you will want to focus on are when you're going to the nursing home, visit regularly because the more you visit the nursing home, the better the care is going to be because you will find quickly if you're going to the nursing home that they are all about what the care visitor want, needs, um, less in some cases about what the, the patients who are there. Although Gary will talk about that because I think that that varies from nursing home to nursing home. That's one of the things that you want to explore when you're looking for a nursing home is to find one where you really feel that the care is good. The other thing is that you would want to do would be to talk to the Alzheimer's Association. Talk to them about the programs that are available, about especially um, their programs for support groups, for people who, so that when you're day to day dealing with folks who are going through Alzheimer's, there's somebody else you can talk to who was going through the same thing, and some people who are trained to speak Alzheimer's. That sounds like a strange term, but Gary's going to talk about the kind, of, the kind of special training that folks really need in order to be dealing with folks who've got you know, uh, mid-stage um, Alzheimer's. So you, you, kind of, you want to find those folks. You want to find the Alzheimer's Association. The Alzheimer's Association, um, so, so uh, Monica is, is your do tax dollars at work. The Alzheimer's Association is kind of everybody's donated dollars at work. I mean, they, it's a national organization devoted to specifically dealing with these issues. And by the way, in general, whether you've got, you, it, you have Alzheimer's or your, your spouse or a loved one does and you're at home or in assisted living or in a nursing home, if there's an issue that comes up at any time, you can call them. They have a 24-hour um, hotline to deal with, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to talk to this slide because I'm holding that slide really for the, second, the next presentation where we're going to talk about early stage Alzheimer's. Um, but they have a 24-hour hotline so that if there is a crisis going on, they can help you. And they can connect you to the local folks who can, who can try to help you right away. They're, they're, like a, they're a wonderful resource together with Bay Path Elder Services, which we're going to talk about a little bit more, right? Yes, sir. Sure, I'm sorry. There. But it's in, yeah, yeah, it's in the, it's on page four. All right. Um, these are really important. And, and you know, and one, kind of one broad comment about the Alzheimer's Association. Best thing you can do, I mean, the good news and the bad news about Alzheimer's is that it tends to go for a long time. You know, this tends to be a slow progression. The earlier you get used to talking to the Alzheimer's Association and to your friends, your tax dollars at work, at Bay Path Elder Services, the better, because you can, you can kind of, in, in anticipation, kind of see the plan that you're going to try to develop, and they can help you figure out what kind of, what kind of state and tax dollars can help you get there. Um, so, if you're Frank and Mary, though, what you really don't want is to be going to the nursing home. It may be that at some point there just cannot be enough care being provided to Mary at home so that Mary can stay safely at home. And so at some point you may have to make that decision, right? But, but you really don't want to. And the people who can help you best in terms of helping you to keep, helping Mary to stay at home versus being in the nursing home are the folks at Bay Path Elder Services. So I'd like to ask Monica, if I could, to talk about Bay Path, talk about them in general, 
and talk about specifically the kinds of programs that, might imp that, that, that they might help you with. And I'm going to ask you if we could to hold all questions until we finish. We're going to make sure that our presentation runs no more than about 45 to 50 minutes, so there's time for any questions. Also, as I said, they're here until 9.30, so they're going to stay here to answer any of your questions afterwards if there are particular questions that you're kind of, you don't want to ask in public or whatever. Monica. Um, okay, so I, I'm, what I'm going to do afterwards too is hand out, there's a, something fresh off the press. Um, we have a new sheet, double-sided sheet with all of our programs um, and information about eligibility criteria um, and what the specific services are. So I'll leave those for you so you can take one with you when you leave. Um, and as Arthur said, Holliston is one of the 14 communities that Bay Path serves. And these are a couple of the um, major programs that you could look to, the Frail Elder Waiver and the Personal Care Attendant Program for long-term services and supports in the home, um, where you can have several hours every day if needed for um, a range of services. Those even, I've been at Bay Path almost 14 years now. When I started, we didn't have that kind of option. So it was just if maybe a few hours a week of services, maybe a little bit more. But because um, there's been so much advocacy to really be able to use the dollars that normally would have gone into a nursing home, to be able to give people the choice to stay at home, we have these, these um, programs and both are funded by uh, Mass Health. But and by the way, the gatekeeper to decide to, to 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 that will decide for Mass Health whether you're eligible for those programs medically is her. Right. It's it's Bay Path Elder Services. So right. I always say the theme of one of these presentations is you want to be her friend, <laughs> always be her friend. <laughs> Um, it's not me specifically. <laughs> yeah. She'll give you her phone you number. You can still be my too. friend. <laughs> but um, so the, really it's Aging Services Access Point is what we are. And that really is, if you call our information and referral department, they will talk with you about the range of needs that you or your loved one might have. And they will hook you up with whatever program or service is needed. Um, and that number, and you'll see it on the handout that I give you, is 508. 573-7200 and you ask for the um, information and referral department and they will direct you. You don't have to figure out ahead of time whether you're eligible. Let us do it. Just call and we'll figure out what your needs are and, and how to best direct you. And how much do your services cost again? Well, that depends. Well, but just the calling and all of that advice and all of that, that's all? That is free. free. And the information and referral is available to anyone, including um, if, say, you have a family, uh, family member who lives in Florida and wants to help um, her mother or father move down there, she could call and say, what are the best, what, how do I do this? Help me figure it all out. Um, and who do I call in Florida to help figure it all out? Can you do that number again? Sure thing. It's 508 573 So anybody can call at any age. You know, if you're a 45 year old son of, a, of an older adult, you can call. There's no. There's no age limit, there's no to call and get information, there's no income limit. Um, so what you find if you call and you talk to somebody in the intake department, one of the options available is the home care program. And through the home care program, you can get a, a whole range of services and supports. And since we're talking about Alzheimer's and related dementias, some of the things that we've seen um, that people tend to benefit from, Meals on Wheels is one, um, personal care, help with bathing, getting in and out of the shower, um, everything from even getting dressed in the morning, 
uh, medical transportation, there's Lifeline. Um, and, and if you're looking at some things that are more specific to Alzheimer's, there are things like medication management help with that. So where we could arrange to have a nurse come out and pre-fill the medication reminder or have somebody do a medication reminder checks, an actual person, there are the machines. So there are things like that. Um, we could have somebody come into the home and do some an evaluation and some coaching for the caregiver. Um, there, we even can do some home modifications to help make things easier for everybody and safer. So there, there are a range of services. And um, what you'll find is when you call and speak with the intake and information and referral folks, you might call with one question and they'll dig a little and find out what more do you need and what more might you el be eligible for. Um, typically, the age range is 60 and above to have home care services. However, if you have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, it can be under age 60. And we have served clients who are under age 60. Um, and there are programs from, for both the care recipient and the caregiver from the moment of diagnosis on. And as Arthur said, you know, you form, we form that relationship from the beginning and we get to know you over time. Um, and, and I'd like to point out the caregiver needs are just as important. And um, we've had the caregiver program probably for about as long as I've been at Bay Path. Can you talk about the support groups and kind of how that works? Yes. Um, so the caregiver program offers one-to-one -one counseling and support. We could meet you in your home, at Starbucks, at your workplace, wherever, um, and do some coaching and counseling. But there are also support groups, and there are um, agencies in the community who provide the support groups. But there are also some specific programs. One is called Powerful Tools for Caregivers. And that is a six-week program that really, it offers not just telling you how you can be a better caregiver, but how do you take care of yourself? If anybody here has been a caregiver for somebody, you know it can be really rewarding, but also you can have a tendency forget, to forget about taking care of your own needs, getting the health care you need, getting exercise, socializing with people. So the Powerful Tools for Caregivers program really helps you come back to how can I take better care of myself and what kind of resources do I need? How do I ask other family members to support me? Um, so it's a great program. Um, there's something else to mention about the caregiver program. We now we got funding through um, the Metro West Health Foundation and we have a website now called Caregiving Metro West and there are all kinds of resources for all of the communities. Um, and there's even, if, if, you like, if you're comfortable using the web, uh, there are chat forums and um, question and answer sections. And you can also ask for a referral through the website. And that's a great resource. So um, what I guess, you know, really what I want to just leave you with is we have all kinds of services. And people in the past used to think, well, maybe it's, um, it's really for only people with low income. Really, there are a range of things that we offer now, including respite for the caregiver, respite for over income. And what that means is um, if you're above the income limits for state home care, but um, you have a caregiver who's doing most of the caregiving, we can provide respite. Um, it's a higher co-payment per month, but um, you get the benefit of having the rate that we negotiate with our vendors so that um, the person that you're caring for can attend adult day health, or we can have in-home companionship so that you could get out, maybe go to work for a few hours, visit your friends, you know, go out golfing, whatever you need to restore yourself. But that respite over income is available. So um, that's something to consider. Thank you, Monica.
Now, one of the things I just want to I want to emphasize about those folks um, is the, the the website that she just mentioned is just terrific. One of the nice things about that website is that you you click to it and you can simply you can literally go by town. You can click to Holliston and they'll tell you all of the various kinds of services that are available to you here. Who the who the care, who the home care people are, who the geriatric care managers are. It's very, very localized, so that you can really try to get the right information. They're just a great service. Now, I just wanted to talk about this a little bit because we were talking about the frail elder waiver. So if Mary is in that situation where she would otherwise be eligible for nursing home care, because you remember she needs help with at least two of the activities of daily living, or, but she, or she's got a cognitive impairment, and they're in this financial situation, then as Monica said, if she'll, she'll qualify medically to stay at home, at which point, Mass Health, if they say that she's certified, Mass Health will pay for as many hours of home care as Baypath says she needs. Right? People think it's, you know, four or five or six hours a week. I've seen 40 hours, 50 hours a week that Baypath will pay for. Now, in that case, there is just one other, there is an additional requirement in addition to the, the financial requirements if she's in a nursing home. In this case, once again, assuming these are Frank and Mary's, a and Frank and Mary's assets, um, um, Mary, in order to qualify this program for this program, can only have $2,000 in countable assets. But Frank, in this case, can have unlimited assets. So if Mary, if Mary had you know, dementia, were medically qualified for nursing home care, she could simply shift all of her assets to Frank on day one. There is no look back period regarding transfers of assets between spouses. And on day two, she could qualify. Um, as long as she meets the income criterion, there is an income criterion. She has to show that she is, she is making less than $2,199 per month. Now, in this case, that's the case. Remember, Mary's income is only $750 a month. Frank's income is not counted. Not counted. Incidentally, because of where Frank's income is, if he needed to qualify for the Frail Elder Waiver, he could, but he would have to pay a very big deductible. I'm not going to go through that because there's just there's a limit to how much we can cover tonight. I'm trying to give you a lot of information from a lot of sources at the same time. But the point is, in this situation, the classic Frank and Mary situation, Mary can qualify for all these benefits and stay home. All she'd have to do is shift her assets to Frank. Remember, Frank then may want to change his will so that if he dies, the assets will still be in trust for Mary and she can remain qualified. Mary Jr. could come and live with her. By the way, one of the other programs that MassHealth has is if Mary Jr. comes and lives with Mary, there's a program called Caregiver Homes, right, through which MassHealth will pay Mary to be at home with her mother, right? Won't pay her a huge amount, pay her up to, I want to say, $18,000 a year, but tax-free. So that if Mary has another job, you know, is working days, but can be there with her mother for most of the time, once again, MassHealth wants Mary to stay home. I'm going to take all questions that, when I finish, because I just want to make sure that I, everybody gets through. Wait, list, just an easy one. Was it $2,000 per total asset or a monthly asset? Or? Total assets, less than $2,000. But, but, but remember, she can shift everything to Frank. She can shift everything, and Frank can have unlimited assets, and she can do that on day one and day two qualify for Mass Health. Her income limit is $2,199 per month. She can't earn more than $2,199 per month, okay? Um, but there's another option, and this is the option that has kind of arisen over time. This didn't exist at all back in, you know, back in my mom's time. I feel like I'm getting, don't you, isn't it funny how you get old fast? You know, I was actually having to figure out I just turned 65, so I feel like I'm a young guy, but, I'm still try but I was trying to figure out if I needed to do the Medicare stuff. It's like awful. It's so complicated, right? So anyway, uh, another option that's available is, memory, is the memory care units at assisted livings. A lot of, in, in 10 or 15 years ago, if you were in an assisted living community because you had thought that's a safer place to be, it's easier to be there, you don't have to hassle with the snow anymore, there's a lot of reasons to be there. But you started, but one of you started having serious dementia problems, you really couldn't stay in the assisted living facility because it wasn't designed for that. That has really changed. And Gary's going to talk about how that works, especially in, in the salmon um, communities, in, in, the Whitney, in Whitney, the Whitney places, right? And talk about how that can work. 
I just wanted to mention this part. Once again, this is a short presentation. I just wanted to give you a sense of this. What typically scares people away from assisted living is, oh my God, how could I ever afford it? It's so expensive. Now for Frank and Mary to go to an assisted living community may be four or $5,000, $6,000, it may be, and, you know, and Gary might be able to talk about that a little bit, especially if you have, you're, you're in a memory care unit because that cost is extra. But I want to mention a couple things. First, remember when you're in an assisted living community, most of your other expenses go away, right? So for Frank and Mary who are now earning $3,000 a month and have um, assets of about $800,000 a month, if they're in an assisted living facility spending $6,000 a month, maybe all their other expenses are going to be another thousand. So it's going to be like $7,000 a month, month is their run rate. They're earning three, which means they're short four. They've got money. Their savings are $800,000, which means that they have the ability, if, I, if my math is right, to stay in that assisted living facility for 200 months. A long time. A long time. If you, if you do the math, it turns out oftentimes this isn't bad. That's number one. Number two, uh, VA and aid in, attend aid in attendance benefit. If Frank or Mary was a veteran who served during a period of war, not even overseas, but during a period of war, um, then chances are, it, it, it's, it's specifically if Frank or Mary needs assistance with two of the activities of daily living, right? Then, they're, then he's going to qualify or she is going to qualify for this aid and attendance benefit available through the Veterans Administration. That benefit can be for between $1,000 and $2,000 per month. There are some asset criteria with that, and I'm not going to go through with the details, but I just want to mention, I remember hearing a statistic from a woman who does a lot of this kind of work that said nationally, something like 70% of all the folks living in assisted livings right now are getting the aid and attendance benefit. That nationally, that's kind of a major facet. Next, third, tax deductibility. Once you require assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living, if you are in an assisted living facility where that assistance is bundled in with your regular payment, then the entire amount of your monthly assisted living bill is a tax deductible medical deduction. Now, that may not be significant for you if you are not earning that much. If you're Frank and Mary and you're only earning $30,000 a year, you know, how much can that deduction be worth to you, right? But if you're Frank and Mary and you're really figuring this out, and you, decide, you may decide, for example, to give some of your money to your children, Peter or Paul or Mary Jr. If one of them is in a high tax bracket, they can then be paying for your assisted living facility and they get the tax deduction. And if they're nice kids, you know, if you get along with them, and so they're nice enough to say that their tax deduction, which they're saving, and in the example that I often use, my, my, Peter, the son, is living in New York City, where the total ta marginal tax rate can be as high as 45%, right? If he's nice, so that for every dollar he's spending on your assisted living, he's saving 45 cents in taxes, right? So if he gets that money and kind of adds this to the pot, it can also really extend how long your money is going to last. So, the, so there, there, and then I'm not going to talk about the, the, the increased spousal allowance because it's too complicated and I want Gary to talk. But I just want you to know if you're thinking you should consider assisted living. Like all of the options that we're presenting, there's no guaranteed right one. We're not trying to sell you a right one. What it was saying is you want to know what these options are. I'd like Gary to talk about the Whitney Place Tapestry Program and, and how Frank and Mary could be living happily for a really a long time there. Gary? Uh, can you hear me all right? <clears throat> all right, we're good. Well, thank you for coming to our talk. Um, I got a few minutes just to talk about some of the options available around dementia care. Um, I'm from Whitney Place, Assisted Living. We actually have two, two or three different types of programs. We have a, a special memory care program in assisted living. We also have a memory care program that follows the same philosophy in our Beaumont nursing homes. Uh, and we also have two adult day health care programs that offer us, um, the Alzheimer's and, and memory care in a day, day setting where people come, they spend the day, then they go home to their families at night. Um, why is this important? 
I think more and more we're finding that the best treatment for Alzheimer's disease is socialization. <coughs> and I know a lot of times we say the best place is at home, the best place is at home, the best place is at home. Well, we're finding more and more that if your home situation is where you're staying home alone or you're staying home with just one person, it may not be the best um, situation for someone with Alzheimer's. I personally have found, from my experience, is that someone with memory problems who's spending a lot of time alone is not a good thing. <laughs> because if you think about it, what are they thinking about when they're home, alone? They're thinking about, I'm losing my memory, what haven't I done, I'm going crazy, and one of the, we, it's not uncommon for, in these situations for us to see some psychiatric disorders like paranoia um, and resistance. And it's a, but it's a tough, tough battle because the Alzheimer's and the dementia is telling people to not go out and stay here because this is where it's safe. When really what we find is socialization is the best treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So there's a couple different options for you now. Socialization could come in the form of home care where you're even having one or two people coming in and visiting with the person will offer some. What we found is the congregate setting is better because um, the treatment is all about relationships. Okay? Um, and people with Alzheimer's can still foster and, ma and maintain relationships if they help. So one of the things we have here, unfortunately this is in our Natick program, we also have an uh, early childhood education program on that same campus. And as one of the things we've, we've really gotten a good handle on over the years is how to care for people with Alzheimer's. And part, a big part of that is knowing the person, knowing the person, uh, who, knowing who the person was before they got sick. So for this gentleman, all right, we do an extensive um, bio on him, and we find out that two of the things that he really valued most in his life were small children and animals. So what can we bring him? We can bring him small children and animals, and that becomes his treatment. Do you think right now he's thinking about, oh my gosh, I'm going crazy, have I done this, have I done this, um, and I'm forgetful? Does he look like he's concentrating on that now? Well, no, what is he focusing on? The rabbit. He's focusing on the rabbit and the boy, right? And what we find is Alzheimer's disease does not have to be the tormented existence that it once was. And if we can keep people in the now, and in the present, they can actually do very well, okay? And the way to do that is by having highly trained caregivers. And so one of the things that we do at Whitney is we have everyone who comes to our company receives eight hours of, of training before they work anywhere. That, that goes from their, our accountants to our kitchen people to our caregivers. Before they work for our company, they got to go through eight hours of dementia training. Our hands-on caregivers then get additional eight hours of classroom time with me, and after they've been there a while, we have an advanced certification program so that many of our caregivers are certified dementia practitioners. Um, and when you know better, you do better. <laughs> um, so that this, this person, if you look at her, she's able to, one of our skills here is being able to capture a group. She's got about 30 people there. This is our adult day health in Northbridge. One person is taking care of 33 people there. She's got them all captivated. They're doing Tai Chi. All right. So being able to lead others and capture that group and get that community spirit is, I think, something that's very, very valuable. Another big part of our training is giving caregivers confidence. Being able to say, I got this. All right. And if you look here, this gentleman, if he's not engaged with something, um, it can be very sexually expressive. Okay? Now, the caregivers could say, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we've got to stay away from him, he's dangerous. Or our caregivers can say, I know if I can get him involved with painting, he's not going to be that way. And he's going to be fine. And I can do this. She can say, this is one of our activity therapists, she says, I got this, I know Paul, we can do this and we're going to be okay. And now is he really focused on, I'm going crazy, I'm losing my mind? No, he's focused on doing a painting, and that's okay. Um, here, this woman, we also talk about initiative, and we call her the puzzle lady. And if she is not occupied with something at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, she's saying, I got to pick up the kids from school. 
All right. So Nancy knows that at 2.30 or quarter to 3, she needs to get her involved with something. And so a lot of times it's knowing your folks, being able to anticipate their needs, um, and offering treatment that way. You know, I've been around a, a lot, a, more than I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, and I can remember when a com... I, old people to do. I, can, I can remember when a... <laughs> I can remember when a common thing that you would see in an Alzheimer's unit is people banging on the door saying, I got to get out, I got to go home, right? In our programs, you don't see that. They don't want to go home. You know why? Because they like where they are. And if we can make people feel safe and feel comfortable, then they don't want to leave. And we have people who come to us who, when they were at home, you know what they were saying? What do you think they were saying when they were at home? I want to go home. They were saying, I want to go home and home. And they come here, and they don't want to go home anymore. You know, although we did have one, one guy, true story, the other day. Okay, do I have a minute for a quick story? Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> Here's a quick story. I was doing a program last week on Alzheimer's stage by stages, an education program that we offer to the community out of Westboro, right? And while we were doing that, a gentleman elopes. You know, he gets out, he gets through the door. We have secure doors, but if you, they're, fi they're, 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 they're called delayed egress. Any of your dementia programs, they're not locked units like jails and prisons and stuff. If you push on the bar for 15 seconds, the door opens, all right? The thing is, though, when the door opens, all these buzzles, buzzes, whistles, and let, you know, woo, 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 all these alarms go off, right? So he gets out, and the alarm's going off, and he's walking down the hall, right? Well, he happens to walk right by our program, and he happens to walk right by our program, and his wife is in the program. <laughs> but she doesn't see it, which is kind of fun. Um, so someone sneaks out the back, and they, they bring him back, all right? But he, had to say, he didn't want to come right back, so he took about a 10-minute walk, right? He comes back through the door, and there's one of his friends waiting for him when he gets back. He gets through the door, and he gives a fist pump to his friend, <laughs> saying, I got out, I did it. <laughs> So <laughs> it was pretty funny. But one, one of the things that tells us about him is he can still be goal-directed. And that's an important thing in dementia. If they can be goal-directed, then they, it really becomes easier to instill a sense of purpose because they can say, I finished this, I did this. So we can set them up for success, like this painting and this puzzle. When they're done, they can feel really good about it. So knowing that they're still in that early or middle stage of the disease when they are goal-directed, I think becomes important. Um, so that's that's kind of it about the about the socialization for for Whitney Whitney uh, Whitney Place assisted living nursing homes daycares. I can't say that enough that a socialization is the best treatment. Um, there's one there's not no one great place. Shop around. I will one last plug I'll give though is for support groups. All right, we run a support group at the Milford VNA. It's now the Salmon Hospice VNA. It meets it's right in Milford. It meets twice a month. Um, we also have support groups that meet in Natick and Westboro. And if you're a caregiver, they say that if you're involved with a support group, your um, the caregiver burden index decreases decreases amazing. And it's the one of the key things that caregivers can do to reduce the stress. Support groups are Alzheimer's support groups are not all about talking about how your mother treated you. It's not a psychotherapy thing. It's more a brainstorming thing. Look, she did this the other day. What should I do? And one of the things we find with caregivers is making decisions is one of the hardest things. Taking over all that decision making in a, in a support group allows you a forum to go and kind of help with that decision making. The Alzheimer's Association has a list of all of the support groups in the area. Shop around. Uh, mine are probably the best ones. So if you want to <laughs> come to um, Milford or Natick or Westboro, you can come to, you can come to those, those support groups. We have some that meet in the day or the evening. Um, but shop around for them because there, there are there are a difference, okay? Um, and I think that's good. So, right. so you can you see why I love doing this work, you know? It's like the people who do this, they're just like really into it, right? Um, and, and, and Gary does a great job and, and his point is well taken. You want to shop around. By the way, for anybody who's looking at their watch, so we started at 10 past 6 because we were doing all my rearranging, so we're going to end at 10 past 7. I'm going to have Shelby, Shelby talk. We're going to be done by about seven um, o'clock here, and then we're going to take questions. Um, so Shelby Marshall uh, um, and her partner have done uh, daycare now for quite a while, do a lot of this kind of stuff, 
And I wanted you to get a sense, once again, from the perspective of Mary. If you've got, if, if you have some, a person you love who is going to be at home, because you want to keep them at home, right? Um, because, in, in for, some, for whatever reason, you, 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 Gary hasn't convinced you that you should be going to one of the Whitney Place or one of the other communities. Then a, the really important kind of gate, I want to say a gateway, the, the window into the world in many cases for your person who is at home are the caregivers who are, who are coming in. So I'd like to have Shelby talk to you about how home care can work in that kind of context, what kind of training you want to look for for people who are doing home care, and, and whether it's going to work for you. Because once again, the goal of the exercise is, is it, is it right for you? Shelby. Great, thanks. Thank you. So thanks so much for coming and for the folks at home. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I think there have been a lot of great points made and I think some of the key takeaways, and we sort of connect to all of these folks, right? So Bay Path Elder Services, fantastic resource for all of you. I think that's been hammered home. The caregivingmetrowest.org website also has a list of uh, town specific resources, including the support groups that Gary mentioned. So again, a great resource for those that maybe sort of don't want to make that call, maybe want to kind of try uh, and do some research on their own. And, um, and I think the, the, the key here and what Arthur really is trying to bring to uh, communities through these types of forums is that really care as you age is really very individualized. So Gary's exactly right. Assisted living may be the best solution for the individual and maybe the best solution for the adult children, sort of, it may be the best solution, right? Because you don't have to worry, what, boy, we had a terrible winter, right? Oh, shoveling, you know, the ice dams, all of that. If you're in assisted living, Whitney Place has to worry about that, right? But you don't have to worry about that. So as the adult child, you go, oh, I don't have to worry about mom and dad's driveway being shoveled or what have you. Um, but on the other hand, there is something to be said about there's no place you know, like home. So my job is not to tell you home care is the best. It is an option. And so if you're going to consider that option to Arthur's point, you want to do your homework, right? So just like you're going to do your homework for assisted living, you're going to ask questions, you're going to interview those facilities, you want to make sure you're an informed consumer. If you're going to go buy a car, right, you do your homework, right? You're not going to just take your buddy's uh, advice on what car to buy or what to pay for it. You're going to do your homework. So. Um, that's me. Uh, that's actually my partner. We've been in business for almost eight years. We're located in Westboro. That's actually our building. So we actually have a real location. Um, and uh, that's our information. I have some other information I can talk with you after if you'd like that. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the benefits of home care. So one of the things that's a little bit different, kind of compare and contrast to um, uh, an assisted living facility, although they do also provide one-to-one -one care, so I want to make sure I'm accurate there, is that all of our care is one-to-one. -one. So we send a, or a home care agency sends a caregiver into the home for a brief period of time during the day, a long period of time during the day, just a slight correction. We're not just daycare, we do overnight care. Uh, we provide respite. So if a family member, if uh, the adult daughter is providing home care um, to their, let's say, we'll, we'll pick on baby dad, right? Um, um, but you know what, you want to be able to take a vacation for a week and go on a cruise, but you're worried you don't want to leave dad at home alone. So we can just come in for a week and provide a little bit of care, peace of mind, so on and so forth. Maybe kind of for that golf, uh, golf outing, golf, excuse me, golf outing or what have you. The key is it's one-to-one -one care and it's customized based on the client's needs. So when you call us, it also, like Bay Path, is a free call. There's no obligation. It's a conversation. I, I tell family members, right now all you're making is an investment of your time. So let's talk about what mom, dad, or your loved one needs, and let's figure out how we make this process simple for you. Um, in our, the case of our agency, which is not true of all, we have nurses on staff, and the nurses work with the family, whomever is calling, or multiple members of the family, to develop a customized care plan. So we, based on our experience, kind of can say, here's what we think you might need based on hours of time in the day and that person's actual needs. And then the care, like I said, is provided when you need it. So in short periods of time, or in some cases, um, just overnight care, um, or uh, uh, weekends, or 24-7. And the key here, and we've sort of talked about this as a theme, is that this care is not just for the individual that may have the Alzheimer's or, or dementia diagnosis, or is just aging and needs some help. The care is as much for the loved one. It could be the spouse or, again, you know, adult children. So um, sometimes there's a real resistance to, so I'm not going to let a stranger in my home. No way. Well, 
you know what, sometimes if you want to stay in your home or quite honestly, even if you want to go see Gary and he's a great guy, he's very talented and they have a great team of folks at Salmon as do many other assisted livings. Those are two, those are also our strangers, right? So life evolves, things change and unfortunately we have to sort of accept change. But as you're doing that, you want to be educated about what, you know, kind of that next stage and what you're accepting. So this is a little bit of an eye chart. I do have handouts for you because um, uh, it's even an eye chart on here. I can't, I'm, I def, I'm glad I'm going to the eye doctor this week, um, speaking of aging. Um, but um, home care agencies are going to provide a, a variety of services. So Arthur mentioned in the beginning activities of daily living. So those are things that we do a lot of. So we help people, we make sure, we may help them actually physically bathing or we may just be there sort of in the bathroom to make sure that they're okay, that may maybe they kind of can't reach their back. I can not I can barely reach my back, you know? So you need to scrub on your back, but you can otherwise take care of yourself. But we're there to make sure you're not gonna slip and fall and that you're safe. We may be helping um, prepare your meals. Um, medication reminders, Monica mentioned that. Um, we can fill the med box. We can have a person actually say, Mrs. Jones, it's actually time to take your morning, lunch, AM pills. That's all documented um, so that the adult child uh, can say, well, what happened today when that caregiver was in the home with mom, dad, et cetera? Um, we do things like transportation. That's such a, such a big deal. I, I almost got lost here, by the way. I've been here a couple times, but I almost got lost again. Thank God for GPS, right? Um, but um, transportation is such a big deal when folks are no longer able to drive. So we help folks with their, their um, medical appointments. That's a common request, right? So we might have an adult child that works in Boston and um, mom or dad needs to get to Framingham for an appointment, but they live in Holliston. So rather than the adult daughter coming all the way from Boston to come pick up, so you could have a caregiver pick, that, pick mom up and meet the daughter at the appointment in Framingham and you know the daughter can bring her back home but now you've got sort of one-to-one -one care you're not putting mom or dad in a taxi nothing wrong with that but it's personalized care and actually kind of walk them to the doctor's appointment which you know may require a wheelchair etc cetera, etc cetera. so little things you know we look at our business like we fill the gaps you have health insurance because I'll get to well how do you pay for this right because that's what everyone's saying well I this is kind of interesting but how do you pay for this um, um, we cover the gaps that healthcare uh, it, health insurance does not pay for. Medicare, neither Medicaid nor Medicare um, uh, uh, nor commercial health insurance like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Harvard currently pay for the types of services we provide. But there is some source funding and we'll talk about that about BayPath. The other thing that um, we do, and again other agencies do this, is we provide some very specialty type services. So there are some folks that may come home after breaking their hip and they need some help, right? They just need some help of how am I going to kind of carry the TV tray and my walker and the phone and everything else? So that's a very different kind of acute type of care. Um, but someone with Alzheimer's, to Gary's point, requires very specialized care. So you want to make sure that the caregivers that are providing that type of care are trained and, um, and that there's oversight. Because remember, this is, you know, it's, it's a wonderful business. We do a lot of great things. But I can tell you, as an owner, having 150 caregivers out in the field, in any given week, there's a, you know, that's a lot going on. It's a lot of risk, it's a lot to manage. And so you wanna make sure you're with an agency that's actually managing those folks. So paying for it, right? Because ultimately it's not for free, I'm sorry to say, I wish it were. So um, the Mass Home Care Program is what we talked about through Bay Path Elder Services. So we work with a lot of families who are eligible for services for home care through Bay Path. And, and let's say they're eligible for six, eight hours a week. And, and so that's sort of how we begin that relationship with the family. And then the family says, this is going really well. Um, we need some more services, but we're not qualified for more services. So they become what we call a private pay client. So some of our pay comes from BayPath and then some of the pay comes from the family's private um, um, sources. Long-term care insurance reimburses for this as long as you qualify for those two ADLs, those activities of daily living. And we help with that sort of process to work with the insurance company. Veterans Aid and Attendance also pays for home care services. So the numbers that um, Arthur shared before about $1,000 to $2,000 a month for the um, uh, veteran and or uh, uh, surviving spouse um, also would apply here. And then obviously personal funds and, and assets. Again, the bad news here, neither Medicaid nor Medicare, nor at this time commercial health insurance pays for the services, although I think we'll 
continue to see that evolve. Whether you like Obamacare or not, I think as we look at our healthcare system, we're going to start to see um, uh, health coverage start to cover what we'd call kind of custodial services, which are largely the services we're providing. Again, that wasn't a political statement. It was just a, is just sort of an observation. So here's the thing. Like doing your homework, we talked about this um, um, briefly. Gary uh, covered that on, in terms of assisted living. Um, you do want to ask your questions. You want to make sure that you find an agency that's going to be a good match for you. I have a brochure um, that I can hand out that talks about some just some basic quality questions to ask as you're interviewing a home care agency. And you should interview a couple. The, the thing here is that um, you will ultimately develop a relationship with the caregiver or caregivers that are, are coming into your home, whether it's for your own care or for a loved ones, but you're also hiring the agency. So you're not just hiring that person that's actually providing the care, you are hiring the agency that is overseeing that, that is screening that person, that is training that person, that is providing the um, uh, supervisory visits in the home and is providing the caregiver support 24-7, 365, trust me, owning a hot dog stand would have been a lot easier because <laughs> we only run out of mustard, right? Um, we are there to take those calls, not through a, 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 you know, a telephone tree or, or sort of an offshore call center. It's our staff taking those calls. They understand mom's and dad's um, you know, situation. And the caregiver calls in their stress, and we just got a call today where the, this lady was very agitated, um, very troubling situation. We could not triage, sort of help the caregiver through the situation, so we sent a nurse out to the home. And, and you know, sort of through that combined effort, we were able to work together. But you want to know that you're not just relying on that one or those one or two caregivers that are coming to the home, but you're, they, you have a relationship with that agency. Um, some of the things you want to think about are uh, licensure, um, it, are they insured, are they accredited, um, what are their employment processes, how do they screen these folks? Um, not everyone has the same screening process. We have a very extensive process above and beyond what Massachusetts requires, uh, including verification up through the Department of Homeland Security that uh, there's a social security trace and so on and so forth. So again, you want to do your homework. Um, and that I can't stress enough here, not unlike in an assisted living, you want to make sure that someone's actually overseeing the caregivers in the home, that this is not sort of the wild west of like, well, it's not match.com, okay? This is not, you know, I'm a senior and I'm looking for three hours of care and I need help taking a bath. You can go that route, but um, I would, quite frankly, I would discourage that. And again, I'll just kind of close in the interest of time, um, um, although I'm certainly available after, that again, can't stress enough whether it's for the folks sitting here in the room or for a friend that you're here representing, it is truly not selfish to look at a support group, to look at home care or to consider um, some alternative living options. Um, change is really hard, but you know, it's sometimes we, we see so often with just a little bit of help can make truly all the difference in the person's quality of life and, uh, and even sometimes how long they can stay at home um, to make, before they have to make that change. Thank you, Shelby. You're welcome. Thank you. So the message here um, is there are a ton of resources that are available. There are programs that are available. These are the folks that you may want to be talking to about those programs. But the best thing you can do is try to figure it out ahead of time. And don't walk away thinking, oh my god, you're in this kind of situation or your, your, your loved one is. The nursing home is inevitable. It's just not. It's just not. So thank you very much for listening. The goal of all of this is peace of mind. The goal, I always tell my clients, the goal of my job is to keep you sleeping well at night. So if this has helped you or it could help you sleep well at night, I hope that, I hope that it has. Um, we are open for any questions, any questions from anybody to any one of the folks that are here. Because if not, they'll stay, they're going to be staying around for a few minutes afterwards just in case you've got individual questions of any one of them. If not, thank you very much. I hope if, if you get a chance, you'll come to the second seminar where we'll be talking about dealing with specifically with issues with early stage dementia, trying to spot it, trying to figure out what the resources that are available. There are a number of resources available specifically for people in that situation. So thank you very much. Do I have a date? I do, and I'll tell you right after I'm done <laughs> because I can't remember it. Oh, and by the way, if you want to see this or any of the programs that we do, um, um, oh. Then, then we have a YouTube channel, which isn't here, but I'm also telling you, we also, Frank and Mary have their own um, Alzheimer's Association uh, uh, team when, we walk, we, and we do a, when they do the walk in September. And we'll be urging all of you folks later on to join Frank and Mary on the walk. Thank you very much.
Thanks for coming.